Do you think it's a good idea to test your software? Do you write unit tests or other automated verification for your code? I think most of us do these days. But a key question is, how do you know whether your tests sufficiently verify your code? And the standard answer is code coverage. But there's a big difference between executing code, which is what code coverage measures, and truly verifying it. On this episode, we'll talk with Austin Bingham. He created a mutation testing framework for Python that goes beyond code coverage to actually perform this verification. It's a fresh and powerful idea. I hope you enjoy it. This is Talk Python to Me, episode 63, recorded June 15th, 2016. I'm a first developer, developer, developer. I'm a developer in many senses of the word because I make these applications, but I also use these verbs to make this music. I construct it line by line, just like when I'm coding another software design. In both cases, it's about design patterns. Anyone can get the job done. It's the execution that matters. I have many interests. Sometimes it can fly. Welcome to Talk Python to Me, a weekly podcast on... Python, the language, the libraries, the ecosystem, and the personalities. This is your host, Michael Kennedy. Follow me on Twitter where I'm at mkennedy. Keep up with the show and listen to past episodes at talkpython.fm and follow the show on Twitter via at talkpython. This episode is brought to you by Hired and SnapCI. Thank them for supporting the show on Twitter via at hired underscore HQ and at snap underscore CI. Hey, everyone. We have an interesting deep dive into the world of Python testing and Python internals today. Before we chat with Austin about mutation testing and his Python library called Cosmic Ray, I have a few goodies to give away to a lucky couple of listeners. First, Austin and his co-author Rob are giving away a copy of their book, The Python Apprentice, as well as two free passes to their online Python course. As always, just visit talkpython.fm and make sure you're a friend of the show to be eligible to win. I'll pick three lucky winners next week. Now, let's meet Austin. Austin, welcome to the show. Uh, Thanks, Mike. I'm really glad to be here. Yeah, I'm super excited to share this mutation testing idea that you've sort of manifested in Python. That's really cool. We'll talk a lot about that. Before we get into it, though, what's your story? How did you get into Python and programming? Well, how I got into programming was uh, when I was quite young, I guess, uh, around 10 years old. We had a computer around the house, and uh, uh, it was old IBM AT or something along those lines. I forget exactly the model. And it uh, could be programmed in BASIC, and that's really caught my attention. My parents got me... uh, some magazines and so forth that taught me how to do more complicated things than I could figure out on my own. And it sort of took off from there. Python, I have tried to figure out where I first started using Python. And to be honest, I'm not entirely sure. I think it was around in graduate school, though. So this would have been in the uh, late 90s. Nice. What did you study in grad school? Uh, That was software engineering. This was at University of Texas at Austin. And we were doing all sorts of stuff related to um, artifact traceability and large-scale software systems. And Somewhere in there, Python showed up for a build system or something along those lines, and it really caught my attention. And it it sort of started there and grew and grew with my career. Uh, It has shown up everywhere since then uh, to larger and larger degrees. So it's something that I've really enjoyed using for the past, I guess, 20 years at this point or so. Yeah, that's that's definitely a while. That's almost from the beginning, right? (laughs) Not quite, but it's pretty close. Yeah, not quite the very beginnings, yes, but it's been a long time, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, awesome. So we were in Oslo together, Norway, last week at with a bunch of other speakers and developers at the NDC, the Norwegian Developer Conference there. And I would say that you and I were the, the guys carrying the Python flag, if you will, right? There was, <laughs> yes. We were kind of uh, the Python guys in the sea among other types of folks, right? Yes. That, that, that's very true. I mean, that's, that's traditionally Python doesn't have a large footprint at that conference. And so you and I definitely were the, uh, the diplomats, I, I think the ambassadors, uh, for, for, for Python, but I'd be, I was surprised at how much interest there was in it among the other delegates. Uh, a lot of people have some, you know, glancing experience with it and they were, I think, interested to see or to learn more about it. So I think it's, it's a growing, uh, topic of interest, even at not traditionally Python, um, heavy conferences and, and venues. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've done Python talks at several conferences that were, I would say, decidedly not Python conferences, and they've been received really, really well. And I think it's just one, one more manifestation or one more piece of evidence that Python is really a growing ecosystem. Yes. Yeah, very much so. And, and it's just gaining in popularity every year. Uh, it's incredible. Yeah. It's, it is, I say this a lot on the show, but it's amazing to me that like, the, sh- the language grew at a pretty 
respectable but not insane growth rate for a really long time and kind of germinated and then you know just caught fire in in the 2000s it's cool yeah so now is the time for python yeah (laughs) it is definitely the time so well the reason i brought up ndc is you had a really cool presentation there on this concept which is a general programming concept it's available in java and maybe some other languages i'm not sure but called mutation testing So I've done a lot of unit testing and other kinds of testing. I've heard of genetic algorithms. So maybe it's genetic algorithms. I actually know, seeing the talk, I know that it's it's not necessarily. Why don't you tell us what mutation testing is? I I thought it was really interesting and I wanted to share it with the audience. Sure, sure. Uh, Mutation testing is, um, you can think of it in some sense as a test for your tests. Uh, It's the main goal of mutation testing is to gauge the effectiveness of your existing tests. So if you take the sort of, theoretically perfect standpoint that you have a test suite that tests 100% of your functionality, uh, at least in principle, then mutation testing can tell you if your test suite actually does test your functionality. You can find holes in your test system, and it can also help you find uh, code in your code base that isn't tested, and maybe you can just be removed because it doesn't actually contribute to any real functionality. So Mutation testing, as you said, has, has nothing to do with uh, genetic algorithms. It doesn't try to search out uh, um, failing test cases or something. It, it's it's a very dumb algorithm. It sy- systematically makes small modifications. It's, it's kind of exhaustive, right? Exactly. It, it's an exhaustive brute force search through a pretty large space um, to try to uh, just trick your tests into passing a mutant. Uh, I mean, the basic idea is that you, you make these very small changes uh, to your code base and then run your test suite. And if your test suite passes then we say that the mutant has survived and this is what you don't want. This means that your test suite is incapable. It doesn't have the fidelity for detecting the change you've made, which we consider you know, an error. Okay. So but before we get into that though, I, you said something that I thought was interesting. You said you have a hundred percent code coverage and yet your tests are not doing their thing. So I think there's like layers of, or levels rather uh, of sort of verifying your test. Like you're writing tests, that's level one, you have tests, they exist. <laughs> it's an existing thing. <laughs> yeah. Less, <laughs> <or> level, <laughs> step two or level two of enlightenment would be you have a significant amount of code coverage because without code coverage, you could have like a thousand tests, but they could all be about some small useless part of your app and the important core section like might actually not be tested. But this supposes you're kind of, you're at level two enlightenment, right? You, you have tests, you have good, maybe not a hundred percent, but you have pretty solid code coverage. And now you want to say, is this actually, there's a difference between executing code and verifying code, right? Right. And this, this is a really important distinction that, that mutation testing uh, gets to the heart of, which is, as you say, you could have 100% coverage in the sense that your test suite causes 100% of your instructions to be executed, however you define that, that instruction you know, set. Um, but it doesn't tell you whether or not traditional coverage doesn't tell you whether or not your tests are verifying the functionality. So um, you could have a a glaring defect in your uh, program that your test suite is exercising, but not actually verifying. And mutation testing goes to the next next level and tries to tell you if your test suite is actually verifying functionality, if it's it's capable of detecting actual errors. And if it's not, then we say that you need a more powerful test suite. Uh, That's the kind of the whole point of mutation testing. It's, it's this sort of adjunct uh, to an existing test suite. And, and just to, to add on that, I mean, th- this question of 100% coverage, um, no matter how you slice it, is a really hard thing for most projects to have. In fact, most projects in the, in, in, in the, in the world don't have anything close to 100% coverage, but mutation testing can still be useful even with uh, systems that don't have 100% coverage. It just is going to sh- throw up a lot of, um, initially at least throw up a lot of flags telling you that you're you have problems where you just don't have tests yet. It's it's not a it's not a it's not a uh, technique that can just be used on systems that have 100% coverage already. I guess that's my point. That's good because that means it would have been excluded from quite a wide bit of <laughs> code out there, right? Yeah, nobody would be able to use it. Yeah, that's that's the truth. Yeah. All right. Okay. So you had there's some really cool ideas here. You talked about a mutant. This this is the idea of like changing your program, introducing some mutation. And it's just some, we find almost randomly, find a spot and make a change and see what the effect is. Because theoretically, you should be able to detect this change with, which broke something, 
presumably by changing it, right? Yeah, that's a, that's that's exactly the the case. The, the, mu- the mutations we're talking about, the the modifications we're talking about, are typically very very small. And so the the the, the kind of canonical example that it's always trotted out is uh, replacing a relational operator. So if I have some line of code that's uh, you know x is less than one, I could change that. The, the mutation would be to change that to x is greater than one, for example, and then make that one small change and then run the test suite again. So these changes are very, very small, but the point is that the changes should all in principle be detectable by a sufficiently powerful test suite. Okay. I That, that sounds like that would be true most of the time, but I think there might be some cases where it, it might not be detectable. Before we get into that though, I want I just want to <laughs> clarify for the listeners, you're not the one doing the mutations, right? Like as a developer, that's not you. Correct. The whole point of a mutation testing tool is that it will do the hard work, the boring work of plowing through your code, finding the places that can potentially be modified, modifying them, and then running your test suite. So it's it, it, in principle, you should be able to point the tool at your code, tell it what your test suite is, and then walk away for probably a very long time <laughs> and then come back to get get your results um and uh yeah you don't it takes away all the drudgery associated with that and um actually gets you some really interesting results typically in the end yeah that is really cool so maybe we could think about like what does the mutation testing tell us because sometimes you might make a change and your code will then fail the test, right? So if, if you were testing that, I select a user and it's equal, the, the count of users I got back was one, and you change that to not equal, for example, your your framework changes it to not equal, obviously that test would fail, but it could also change things that I don't detect up, I don't detect. Yes, that, that's true. You, you, can have a, you can have a result where your test suite passes a mutant, and then you go examine the code, and you realize that there's really no way to write a realistic test that would detect that change. And, and this, this is a class of mutants that, in, if you read the, the literature, is called an equivalent mutant. And an equivalent mutant is, is exactly that, a mutant that is functionally equivalent. It's still a mutant. It's been changed, but it's still functionally equivalent to the original program. And for some reason or the other, and this is a very language-specific thing, but for some reason or the other, you simply cannot detect it. And it's, it's this, what, this is one of the really tricky, difficult aspects of mutation testing is ferreting out and somehow avoiding these equivalent mutants. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. So obviously, if we mutate it and then the tests fail, that's a upvote for our test, right? We made a change to the code. Uh, we reran the test. The test said, your code has changed. It's no longer good. But then sometimes... It, it might not come back. Is it possible that if like you change some kind of like while loop condition, it could just go forever? That, that's entirely possible. And this, this is um, yet another class of, of complexities that we have to deal with in mutation testing. Um, the, uh, these um, mutants that, well, it, it, the great example, the canonical example is what you said. They go into an infinite loop. So if I change, for example, um, one, one mutation would be to change a break to a continue. And if you do that, then you typically create a situation where an infinite loop is very, very likely because you've you've taken a place where your code is in the exit condition and then where it wants to break. And you said, no, don't break, continue the loop. It's going to stay in the exit condition and just kind of continue forever. So that that's um, that kind of mutant falls into the category that we call incompetent. And I, I guess I should back up and say there's there are sort of three main categories for, for mutants. After you've run your test suite, you have some results. So the... You talked about uh, just a second ago where the test suite fails, and we call it, we say that in that case your test suite has killed the mutant. Your test suite has failed, indicating that it knows that you've made a change. The other broad category is that your mutant survives; that is, your test suite passes. And this is this is the where we start to look for weaknesses in our test suite. The third sort of um, smaller category is this category of incompetent mutants. Most incompetent mutants. Uh, fail immediately by throwing an exception or failing to compile or doing something along those lines, something catastrophic that prevents them from actually even being run under the test suite. Uh, and these, we still count these as killed. These, these go in the, the, the checkbox category and you know, this is good. But there are some incompetent mutants that do things like you say, just run forever or maybe run for a very, 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 very long time. So long that we don't really want to try to see if they stop. So, um, this area is uh, a difficult one. It's, it's, it's one that you have to address on a practical level when you develop tools to do um, mutation testing, this, this problem of uh, incompetence. And, you know, 
you start looking into the theory of detecting incompetent mutants, and you run smack into Alan Turing's famous proof about the halting problem, saying that you cannot look at a program and determine a priori if it's going to stop running at some point in the future. Uh, and that's the problem you face with incompetent mutants and mutation testing. Yeah, there's not even much reasoning about it because it's just a brute force method anyway. Correct, yeah. Yeah, that's a big challenge. Can you give me some idea of like how frequent that category shows up? Is that like 0.1%, 5%, 10%? That's a, it's a tough question to answer on a global scale um, <laughs> because I, I mean, I obviously haven't run mutation testing on every program, but in my experience, it's a relatively small amount. I mean, less than 1% of mutations, far less than 1% of mutations become incompetent. They're not a huge problem in practice because the strategies we use to deal with them are really simple. Uh, which basically what we do is we time out. We, we, we establish using one method or another, a timeout for your test suite. And if it takes longer than the timeout, then we just count that as incompetent. We say that mutant is in an infinite loop or in a huge loop. And we're going to say that it didn't get to run. If you consider performance part of your feature set, maybe it's failed anyway, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's clearly uh, problematic at that point. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And there's, you actually had two ways of timing out. Like you could just say, well, we're never going to run tests more than five minutes, but you had a cool thing to do with baselines as well, right? In the, the tools that we have right now for uh, testing, uh, mutation, doing mutation testing in Python, uh, the approach we take is to, well, as you said, one way is let the user provide a timeout. They can just provide an absolute timeout and we'll, we'll honor that. Or we can run the, we can run the test suite over unmutated code and time that and use that as a baseline and then let the user provide uh, some multiplier, uh, say two or three. And then if the, if a mutant's test suite takes longer than you know, n times the baseline timing, then we consider that an incompetent mutant and we kill it off. So this is our really simple, but generally very effective approach to dealing with the halting problem uh, in practice. Yeah, it's way easier than proving it, right? <laughs> right, yes, it's a, that would be yeah, really difficult to do. <laughs> yeah, nice. Okay, so we have obviously the, the case where the mutant is killed. We have this incompetent mutant, which we kind of can't really deal with. But then we have the more challenging case. The, it's maybe the interesting case, you would say, where you've changed the code, you run the tests, and the tests all still pass, right? So that there's a couple of conclusions you could draw from this, yeah? Uh, well, yeah. If 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 you've made a mutation and the and the um, and the tests still pass, then you you have a, a couple of things to to look into. Uh, one possibility, the, the the standard thing that happens in that case is that you just don't have enough tests. You need more or better tests because you you have some change that was undetected by your test suite. The other very common, although the less common, but still quite common case is that you have code in your program that doesn't need to be there anymore. It's, it's extra code that doesn't contribute to any functionality. So your test, in that case, your test suite is, is perfectly good because it's testing the things it needs to be testing, the, the, the important functionality of your program. But you've got bits of code that can be mutated, but aren't being tested. So you should yank those bits of code out. If you, if you view code as a liability rather than, you know, something important to keep around, you can just get rid of it at that point. The third possibility, and this is really a subcategory of the first, is that we come back to this notion of equivalent mutants, mutants that they have been changed. Our test suite hasn't detected them, but there's no practical way to write a test for those. And there's all sorts of interesting examples of these. Um, they're a, a bit difficult to describe, perhaps, uh, purely without, you know, without showing some, some code. Speaking of showing, the all the videos of the sessions, including yours and mine from NDC, will be on online shortly. And so as soon as they are online, I'll put a link to your presentation so people can go back and see it. But yeah, it is tough to talk about um, code examples on the on audio, right? It, it, yeah, it, it's quite difficult. I, but if uh, for Python, I think I could probably describe the the Dunder Main. Um, Example. Yeah, go for it. So one equivalent mutant that, um, you know, in retrospect is quite obvious, but I hadn't really anticipated, uh, is uh, the, the the standard idiom in Python of using dunder name equals dunder main to to set up your your main block. You know, when you're writing a program, uh, but of course, if you've got that in your in your um, program and you have any kind of code in that block that can be mutated, the mutation testing suite will mutate that code. But of course, that block is never executed in a test because it's not it's not accessible inside a test because dunder name does not equal dunder main in that case ever. 
So you, you have this really interesting case where you have this whole body of code that's really important to your program in, 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 a, in a way, but that cannot be tested and, and, and never will be tested. So that's that's the flavor of, of at least some equivalent mutants. But one of the joys of equivalent mutants is that when you find them, you have these aha moments almost every time because they, <laughs> they, um, they're, they're surprising, they're interesting, and they kind of make you scratch your head a little bit. Uh, and so it's, it's one of the, I guess you might say, strange joys of mutation testing. <laughs> yeah, that does sound, uh, sound pretty interesting. It definitely gives you some, some insight you probably wouldn't uh, normally get. This episode is brought to you by Hired. Hired is a two-sided curated marketplace that connects the world's knowledge workers to the best opportunities. Each offer you receive has salary and equity presented right up front, and you can view the offers to accept or reject them before you even talk to the company. Typically, candidates receive five or more offers within the first week, and there are no obligations, ever. Sounds awesome, doesn't it? Well, did I mention the signing bonus? Everyone who accepts a job from Hired gets a $1,000 signing bonus. And as Talk Python listeners, it gets way sweeter. Use the link hired.com slash talk to me and Hired will double the signing bonus to $2,000. Opportunities knocking. Visit hired.com slash talk to me and answer the call. Uh, one example that I was thinking of when you were talking about that category is like logging, right? So maybe you've got some some test and it says, if this, then log this thing, else log that. And, you know, would it really make sense to, like, write a test to detect what you're logging? Right. That's a really good point. I mean, most, uh, a, a large category of equivalent mutants are exactly of that flavor. That they're, the, the changes caused by the mutation are things that you, in principle, could test for, but you never would because there's no reason to do it. They, there's no, uh, there may be no business reason to do it. There may be just no practical reason to do it, depending on what values are driving your, your project. Um, and so you end up not ever writing tests for those. And one of the challenges of mutation testing, uh, of writing mutation testing tools is allowing your user to specify in some way, shape or form that mutation should not be performed on certain bodies of code for various reasons. And, and this is um, something that uh, all the tools that, that do mutation testing have to account for in some way, shape or form. Okay. So I'm going to hold my question on like how you deal with that until we get to your framework. <laughs> Okay, good. <laughs> because, because that is a really interesting problem, and I, I want to dig into it. But before we do, like, could you give us some, you know, you talked about the, the sort of the basic changes, like if, if you've got a less than, change that to a greater than. There's, there's a whole variety of different types. There's like language agnostic changes. There's changes you can make that affect object-oriented programming. Can you give us like a sense of, of those? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, so there's, this is actually one of the areas where sort of there's active research into mutation testing. It's not a, there's not a huge uh, group of people doing this research, but the research that is going on is to a large degree into which kinds of mutations should we be actually performing. So you mentioned that there are, uh, well, there's some, some mutations that are language agnostic in the sense that they, they apply to almost all programming languages you can imagine. And so a, a typical example would be something like uh, replacing a constant. If you found the constant four in, the, in your code, the mutation testing suite might change that to five or 19 or negative six or something like that. So this is, you know, it's an obvious change that, I mean, it's, it's a sort of blatant change. It should be obviously testable. And so it, it's, a, it's, it's ripe for uh, that kind of thing. But other examples include things like uh, replacing arithmetic operators, removing unary or adding unary operators. Uh, we talked earlier about re uh, relational operators, replacing those. And all of these um, sort of fall into, uh, they, they, they're, they're broadly applicable. You could see them being applied in a functional language or an OO language or you know, any other you know, procedural language, whatever, whatever kind of language you happen to be working on. But some research has looked into uh, mutations that are specific to, for example, object-oriented languages. Uh, most, uh, well, well, not Python, but a, a lot of object-oriented languages have uh, access modifiers, for example, private, public, protected, and so forth. And so one really clever and interesting um, mutation is to replace public with private or vice versa, or to basically go in and, and mess with the access modifiers and see if that is detected by the test suite. Often that results in something that can't compile in C++, for example, if you changed, you know, public to private, that would probably break compilation of, of, of many programs. But changing private to public 
It's hard to say. Um, that's that's actually very, very difficult to test for. Other examples uh, of OO specific uh, mutations would include, for example, changing base class order. This is another one that, it, that can have really dramatic effects on what your program does. Or in other cases, it can have absolutely no effect whatsoever. So you can you could see how changing base class order in Python, for example, could have a completely undetectable, almost completely undetectable change to a program. The only way to detect that would be if you had a test that was checking base class order, was checking the MRO for the class. And of course, nobody's going to write that test. And I'm not advocating that anybody write that kind of test. That's not the um, kind of code you want to write, that's for sure. Right, it's a complete waste of time. So <laughs> um, so it, that, that's, a, it's a, I think, a fairly enlightening example of the kinds of problems you face doing mutation testing. As, as elegant and interesting and straightforward as the approach sounds, there are these really difficult, thorny edge cases you have to deal with. Other branches of research into, uh, for example, functional muta- you know, mutations for functional languages, and uh, the classic example there, a lot of Haskell-like and F-sharp-like languages have pattern matching, for example, on their functions, and changing the order of pattern matching is a, is a common mutation you might perform on a language like that. And that, that again, is another area where sometimes changing the order makes a huge difference, and sometimes changing the order makes absolutely no difference. And in those cases, I actually don't know how you would test for them, because they're undetectable unless you have introspection and you have you know, uh, reflection capabilities. You actually go in and do the kinds of tests I talked about a second ago that you would never write. So it's it's a fascinating field to, uh, to, to kind of dip your toe into. And, and the papers are pretty accessible if you want to read about these kinds of things as well. It sounds to me like one of the major challenges that you're going to run into as it, for any almost any reasonable sized program is that it, it's going to be really slow, right? Because you're looking at basically every permutation of all the operators in, you know, inheritance method, it's just, it, there's a crazy number of things in play here, right? That's absolutely true. I think the, the single biggest practical problem with mutation testing, the single biggest practical roadblock for using mutation testing is that it takes a long, long, long time to do. Um, if you consider the possibility of having you know, dozens or, uh, you know, a hundred operators, the, you know, uh, kinds of mutations that you might make in your code. And you have a large code base, you know, hundreds of thousands of lines of code is not uncommon uh, in, you know, in valuable systems uh, or even not very valuable systems for that matter. And then you consider the fact also that a test suite might take a considerable amount of time to run. So you, you, you have this uh, triply nested loop of, uh, you know, the operators, the places those operators can be applied and the amount of time it takes to run your test suite. And you're talking about, you know, if you do the math, you can find on some systems that adds up to years. I mean, literally, it's, it's not something you can do um, on a practical basis for all your code in any way, shape, or form. But there are some strategies that we can apply to um, try to deal with that. The most basic strategy is simply to parallelize. For, for all the problems we have with long run times in mutation testing, the, the saving grace is perhaps that it's embarrassingly parallel. Uh, you can run each mutation slash test suite run in a completely separate process all at the same time if you want to, and the, it won't, ref- won't affect the results. So you could, in principle, go to you know, Azure or, or Amazon and uh, rent for five minutes, you know, 10,000 or 100,000 machines or whatever they'll let you get, run all your tests, and then be done with it. But that's not something that uh, is probably economically feasible for most people. So other approaches that there are to, to dealing with this, um, well, there's not that many other approaches that, that, that I'm aware of, but one is another form of baselining. We talked earlier about baselining for your uh, timeouts, uh, you know, when, when to kill the test suite and call it a competent. Another kind of baseline that you can do is to run a full test suite with all your, all your operators over all your code and get those results. And then when, as you start making changes to your code base, only run the tests that you know work and exercise modified code, code that you've changed. And that way you can drastically reduce the scope of the, uh, the number of tests you need to run. And that, that drastically reduces the number of operators that can apply, the amount of code space that can be potentially modified and so forth. Also, you can, all, you can tell your mutation testing system to only mutate code that was modified. So basically, we're, we're analyzing deltas, analyzing our, our git diffs, so to speak, and saying only run the tests that we know could possibly have an impact or be impacted by the changes that were made. And this is a, pra- this is a heuristic approach to, to speeding things up because, of course, it's not, uh, it's not watertight. You, you could, of course, make changes to your code that influence the code paths that your tests are now exercising. And if you purely 
use ba this kind of baselining for uh, determining which tests to run and what to test, then you'd be missing things. So you have to occasionally do, or at least in principle, you'll be missing things. So you'll have to do occasional rebaselinings to make sure that you've kept up with all of your changes. And it also assumes that you have some way of correlating your tests with lines of code. So this is where mutation testing um, and traditional coverage testing uh, coverage analysis tools can come into uh, come into play where they can work work together because now you can say okay I take the coverage analysis information I know which tests exercise which lines of code I could couple that you know kind of compare it to the deltas and determine which tests need to be run by the mutation testing suite right it's it's like a, basically like an inverted code coverage right so if I look at this test what part of my code in my real app changed or or somehow was affected by running this test right and so that's the you could just focus on say like 10 lines of code or probably way more than that but focus it in on that area right exactly that's the point is is drastically reduce the the, the space and if yeah i think in principle you could get this down to where you could run things fast enough uh that you could do it on every commit or, or bundles of commits rather than once a week or something along those lines which may or may not be desirable but it's an interesting goal um from a tool developer's point of view. Yeah, it's definitely an interesting goal. One of the things I was thinking of, of as you said this was, is this a thing that needs to run on say every check-in or every time you want to run your tests? Because if you have a good set of tests, hopefully your tests are actually catching your bugs. And this feels to me like a validation of your tests rather than, it seems like it, it could theoretically run less often and still be really valuable. I think in practice, you're right. That it doesn't need to run on every check-in. But if you're working on a team that wants perfect code coverage, for example, and that requires, say you have a policy on a legacy code system that any change you make needs to be backed up by tests, which is a common thing to do with you know existing legacy systems uh, that are trying to improve their, their lot in this world. Um, you might have that policy. This is on every commit. Uh, whatever changes you've made need to be backed up by tests. And this is a good way to verify that. Um, not, not to verify just that you've made tests, but to verify that the tests you've created actually test the, <laughs> you to test the functionality correctly. And so if you can make mutation testing fast enough, you could actually enforce that kind of constraint in a, in a pretty strong way. And that's an interesting, interesting thing. Yeah, that is quite interesting because my experience is there's a massive difference among team members on their level of embracing testing and how much they run the test. Like some people are really into it. Some people only run it if there's something making them run it basically. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's very true. And so you can, uh, now you have a new stick to you know, beat people around the head with if you have mutation <laughs> testing in place. <laughs> nice. So let's make this, uh, let's bring this down to Python. Let's make it concrete. Let's talk about this thing called cosmic ray that you created. Okay, yeah, Cosmic Ray is, um, as you just hinted, it's a mutation testing tool for Python. I should say it's not the first mutation testing tool for Python. There were a few available when I started writing it, but none of them were work. They didn't quite work the way I wanted, or they were unmaintained. And really, this was an interesting project in its own right. So this started out almost as just a a fun thing to do, uh, and it turned out to be a really fascinating project all around. But Cosmic Ray is um, it's a system for Finding, uh, searching through your, your Python code, uh, finding places to mutate, making those mutations, and then running your test suite. Um, and it's a, a fairly young project, and it uh, has quite a bit of work left to be done on it, but it has produced some results already, so it's, it's, it's uh, looking quite promising. It's about, I don't know, about a year and a half old, I think, at this point, and really has only been used by me and a few you know, sort of close, trusted friends. But um, it's open source, it's on GitHub, and anybody who wants to try it or make contributions or give any feedback is, is more than welcome and, in fact, encouraged to you know, go take a look at it. Yeah, Yeah, awesome. And I'll be sure to link to, to the GitHub repo and things like that. And it's on PyPI, of course, right? Uh, honestly, I'm not sure. I think it is, but I don't know the last time I pushed up a <laughs> version to PyPI. Um, Let me see here. Da, da, da. Yes, it is. It is on, it's cosmic underscore ray on PyPI. <laughs> Woo. Okay. <Yes>. Yeah. <laughs> Saved. <laughs> I guess the interesting parts for a lot of, a lot of people are going to be how, how cosmic ray works internally. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. There, there's some really amazing stuff in there. Before we get into that, could you just really quickly, like, Tell me, what do I need to do? Like if I've got some some Python app with some tests, you know, I'm using PyTest or something like that. Like what are my steps to apply this? 
The steps are, well, pretty straightforward. Um, identify the parts of your code that you want to mutation test. Um, and, you know, very often you'll have some part of your code that is, has a good test suite and is, you know, is heavily thoroughly tested and, and, and is central to the functioning and other parts that aren't. And you can use Cosmic Ray to you know, divvy out and, and slice and dice the, the parts you do and do not want to test. So if you just want to take it for a spin, identify some, some module that you're interested in. Because you want it to happen in a non-trivial, you know, in a short amount of time, right? Well, that's, that's one of the other reasons. Yeah, you, you'll get more bang for your buck if you're just trying to test drive this than if you try to run it over, you know, a, a 10,000. If you want to run this over Django, forget it. It's not going to work. But I mean, not in a practical sense. But if you want to run it over a single module in Django or, you know, some other package, then you'll have more luck. That's been my experience, at least with it so far. But yeah, you'll, you'll need a test suite. Uh, right now, we only support unit test. The, the standard library unit test and PyTest as our, um, the test suites we support. But there's a plugin system for other testing systems. Um, if you feel you need one supported, they're pretty easy to add. Point Cosmic Ray at your module and at your test suite, and you'll pass it a few other parameters, you know, the things having to do with timeouts and so forth. Uh, and it will build up a work order, you know, basically the list of things it's going to do and put those in a little database. And then you'll need to set up Celery. Uh, Celery is uh, a... Uh, a task distribution queue that uh, is runs on top of RabbitMQ uh, by default. And this, we use Celery to distribute work out to workers that actually do the mutation, run a test suite, and then send results back. And so you'll have workers sitting on your your uh, Celery queue, and then you'll tell Cosmic Ray to run the work order that it's built, and it will start doling out work to these workers and collating the work, the results back into the little database it's got. And that's, um, I mean, that's, that's the short version of what you need to do. Once you have results back, then you start analyzing them and trying to figure out what Cosmic Ray is telling you. Right. You look at those three categories, you decide what, what to ignore, what not to ignore. Gone are the days of tweaking your server, merging your code, and just hoping it works in your production environment. With SnapCI's cloud-based hosted continuous delivery tool, you simply do a git push, and they auto-detect and run all the necessary tests through their multi-stage pipelines. Something fails, you can even debug it directly in the browser. With a one-click deployment that you can do from your desk or from 30,000 feet in the air, Snap offers flexibility and ease of mind. Imagine all the time you'll save. Thanks SnapCI for sponsoring this episode by trying them for free at snap.ci slash talkpython. And is there a way to flag it and say, this, this thing you've detected here, I want to ignore that? Not yet. And this is actually one of the big open areas for development is how do we let users specify exceptions effectively? How do we let them say, don't make this mutation on this line of code, or even more coarsely, don't make mutations on this line of code? Uh, because we, we need that kind of thing because of the problems of equivalent mutants and, and so forth that we have no real solution to. Right now, there's some thought about the direction to take this in, you know, how to deal with it. Um, if you look at tools like PyLint, they have great systems for putting essentially work you know, it orders into the into comments in your code, telling PyLint, you know, please don't apply rule such and such to this line of code. We could probably apply the same kind of technique to Cosmic Ray, but I'm not sure yet if that's better than having some extrinsic dis description of exceptions. It's it's basically an open question. And if anybody has ideas or wants to take a swing at it, that's this really is one of the big things that we need to sort out soon. Let's look inside. Basically, you point Cosmic Ray at your module and you say, go shred this thing. And for every shred that you create, go run the unit test, right? That That's exactly right. They, yeah. walk, walk us through the internals there. What, there. There's some interesting stuff you're doing. Well, uh, the, at the core of all of this is uh, the the standard library module AST. AST is short for what's an acronym for abstract syntax tree. An abstract syntax tree is just a programmatic structure defining the, the a program. This the syntax of, uh, uh, in your source code. When Python parses your source code, it produces an abstract syntax tree, and then you can access this looking at the different nodes in the tree. You know, looking at the, the different parts of your program, and not just look at them, but you can also change them. 
So what AST allows you to, allows us to do in Cosmic Ray is load up your source code. We literally read your source code from your .py file, and we pass it into a parse function, which parses the source code into the abstract, abstract syntax tree. And then AST has other components, which allow us to walk down that tree, and if we want to, make changes. The details of exactly how it does that, well, so I, I, it might be difficult to talk about operators and things like that in too great of detail. Yeah, so, well, basically, you, you get this abstract syntax tree, and then you start applying your transformations to it, right? Your your mutations, if you will, yeah? Well, that, that's the fundamental idea, yes. So uh, you, you have the AST, and you find a place that you want to make a modification, and then you make a modification to it. You can, and there's, there's support in the AST module for doing that kind of work. Once you've modified the AST, you then need to get it you need to make it available to your test suite. You need to make it importable. And the, the next, that's a, a whole other kind of second level trick. Yeah, because there's one thing to say, hey, Python, run this module. It's another to load up an individual AST and then turn that into executionable, executable <laughs> things, right? <laughs> exactly. And yeah, that was everything uh, it depends upon and so on. That, that was, uh, that was uh, sort of the second big phase of work in, in building Cosmic Ray was figuring out how to do that. So. Once you have an AST, a modified AST, you can pass that to the built-in compile function, and that spits out what's called a, a code object, and that's uh, this kind of thing that modules can use, so to speak, or that we can execute to populate a module. So figuring out how to make that available, make your modified AST available through the standard import was, was a big goal of, of um, Cosmic Ray. We didn't want people to have to modify their test suites to do mutation tests. We wanted the test suites to just n naturally say import you know, import of the module and get the right one. So we uh, had to do a lot of investigation into how Python does this. And at the core, there's there's three main moving parts to how Python does uh, imports, how it, how it lets you control imports. The first thing is what's called a finder. And a, fi a finder is a, an object that's a class typically, but a, a function or a class that's responsible for telling Python that it knows how to load a module given that module's name. So Python will ask the finder, I've been asked to import foo, do you know how to do anything with foo? And a finder can say yes or no. If a finder does know how to load something, it returns what's called a loader. And the loader is then responsible for populating essentially the shell of a, a module. So Python will make the empty shell of the module, pass it to the loader, and say, okay, now you populate this with the names, the functions, the name bindings, the constants, all that kind of stuff that come from the module that you're supposed to be loading for me. What we do is, uh, in Cosmic Ray, we have our own custom finder, and that finder is given the modified AST, and it's told the name of the module. And if it's then asked by Python, you know, do you know how to load that module? It'll say yes, and then it hands back a loader. We have a custom loader, which also has this AST. And uh, it's the custom loader is able to execute the uh, AST, or compile the AST, I should say, and then use that compiled AST to populate the the shell module. And then that shell module is passed back to Python and it's it naturally imported so that everybody can use it. The, I guess the last sort of moving part in this, in this whole system is something called sys.metapath. If you import sys, you'll see that it has an attribute called metapath. Metapath is just a list of finders. And when Python wants to import something, and some experts might tell me that I'm a little bit wrong in the details, but this is effectively correct. Python marches down Metapath asking each finder in order, do you know how to load this name? And the first finder that responds um, is the one that wins. So what we do is we take our custom finder, we populate it with its AST and its name, and we stick it at the front of Metapath inside our worker processes. And these worker processes then are able to hijack the import system in a sense and put these mutated ASTs directly into place so that nobody has to know they're there, but they get imported naturally by whoever wants to use them. So that's the, the long and the short, I guess, of how we stick mutated ASTs into Python programs. Yeah, you, you really had to dig deep down inside the, the guts of Python. You had to take the red pill, not the blue pill, right? Yeah, there, there, there was a lot of uh, pet archaeology and stuff here to, <laughs> to get to the bottom of this. But at the end, it's very elegant and powerful. It's, it's, it's a, it was... I mean, one of the joys of this project was learning all this stuff that I may never apply again, but I feel like I've, I've reached, yeah, the, the next level of, of my Python expertise in a sense. Yeah, that's really cool. But it's awesome because you don't change your code to make this happen, right? It's, it, it adapts to what it has to do to, to basically take over. Exactly. We, we work, I, I, Cosmic Ray works at a deep enough level that your 
neither your test code nor your code under test needs to be modified to use Cosmic Ray. Um, it, it should work transparently um, in, in all ways. Yeah, that was a big goal of the project. You talked about Celery. Celery is really awesome. Uh, there was a couple of other really cool um, projects that you're kind of built upon. One of them was this thing called TinyDB. Yeah, <laughs> TinyDB. I, so we, uh, is it, well, it, it is what its name says. It's a tiny database. It's a little uh, um, embedded you know, file-oriented JSON database that uh, you can import into your Python program and use with basically no configuration. So it was exactly what I was looking for when I was looking for a database for uh, Cosmic Ray. Uh, what well, we use the database for basically keeping track of the, the work order I described earlier. When we, you know, the, the first thing you do in a mutation testing run is figure out what it is you're going to do and write all that down. We write that into the database. And then as the results arrive back via Celery, we stick that, the results back into this database. So TinyDB is, um, something that's worked out really well for us so far. Um, and it was, as I said, super easy to use and it's stuck around so far. I, I have a feeling that it's going to end up being a bottleneck in larger projects. But um, I, that's a gut feeling. I don't have any uh, evidence to indicate that. But if, if it has to be replaced, then we'll start looking at something like uh, SQLite or maybe we'll make the user, give the user the power to specify MongoDB or whatever they want. But uh, TinyDB is really worth looking at. Um, I think if you, if you don't have really sophisticated needs in, in a database and you want something that's just file oriented, it's a really beautiful little program that worked out of the box with really no reading on my part whatsoever. That's lovely. I really like to use uh, SQLite and SQL Alchemy together, and, mm. and those work really well in sort of an equivalent way, but I'm a huge fan of the document databases. The, the big selling, well, one of the big selling points, what, what made me stick with TinyDB is that I can, it literally is a JSON file. I can open it up in Emacs and just look at it, and I don't have to have any extra tools to examine its contents. Um, that, you know, I, I think that that json nature is what's going to be its downfall that's what makes me think it's not going to last that long for this project but um that's been a real selling point is i can you know run my tests um as i'm testing cosmic ray which as you might imagine is a real challenge and then uh see what's in the database really really easily and so my my cycle time has been pretty high uh by using tiny db oh yeah that's cool and it's 100 percent python according to github uh that sounds right yeah I, I don't remember any compilation happening when i used it yeah Nice. Yeah, it has a thousand stars, so it's it's doing pretty well. I definitely want to check it out. The other one was DocOpt. Yeah, uh, DocOpt is one of my my current favorite uh, packages uh, for not just Python but for lots and lots of languages. Um, DocOpt is, is is this um, it's a tool for building command line parsers, but unlike things like ArgParse or the other sort of standard tools for doing this, it takes this it takes a kind of a backwards approach. You provide it with a string, which is the POSIX standard help output that you would get from any program, you know, saying you know, usage colon program name, blah, blah, option names and all that kind of stuff. And that the, the, the text information somebody gets when they type, you know, program dash H, you give that string to Cosmic Ray. And from that, it generates a parser that can then parse command line arguments. So you never have to think really hard about, you know, building up these parser objects yourself everything is done magically and all you have to do is think about how your pretty help message is going to look which you got to write anyway which which yeah you you either have to write or have to get generated by some other tool but uh this this has this has the neat effect that embedded in your code somewhere is your full help message that is great documentation not just for your users but also also other programmers looking at your code it really it solves a really annoying problem that everybody in the, every programmer in the world has, which is writing parsers for command line arguments. And it does it in a really slick way. And what's interesting, one of the interesting things is that I didn't know this until I looked at DocOpt is that there actually is a POSIX standard for, for these help messages. So it, it can rely on an actual existing standard for defining these things, which is really cool. That is cool. Actually, that's the first way that I had heard of that there was a standard was by learning about DocDoc. Yeah. Like, wait, there's yeah. a standard for the help message? <laughs> yeah. Interesting. I, I highly recommend that anybody who has, who has to write command line tools and who hasn't tried DocOp, take a look at it. It's, it's, it's really addictive and you can produce really, really powerful um, command line parsers, you know, things like, um, like you have with Git, you know, sub command based uh, tools and stuff. I guess the other interesting thing about DocOp is that while it was really, it was originally written in Python, the original, the canonical implementation is Python. It, it exists now for something like 30 languages. 
Um, so if you're a sometimes C Sharp developer, sometimes Java developer, sometimes whatever developer, you can continue using DocOpt in those languages as well. It's um, a neat project from that point of view, something that uh, you don't see a lot of. Definitely means the idea of it resonated super well, right? Yeah, yeah, it did. Okay, so we're getting kind of near the end of the show, and I wanted to ask you, you know, you have a, a company called 60 North, right? That's correct, yes. Yeah, you and Robert Spolshire, is that right? That's right, yes. Yeah, you guys work together. Yeah, you guys are up in Norway, which is why I ran into you in Oslo. That's, <laughs> that's, that's right. awesome. Although we also <laughs> seem to run into each other in London. So yeah. what do you guys, yeah, what do you guys do there? Uh, well, 60 North, uh, we're not terribly pigeonholed, but we do do a lot of Python work. We uh, do consulting, training, uh, some, some development of our own as well. Uh, we have uh, we've made some courses for Plural Site. So if you if you go to Plural Site and you look for the Python training courses, we have the their Python Fundamentals is our first course, and Python Beyond the Basics, which is sort of the the next step, intermediate level, is there. And we're working on a third one, which is uh, uh, Advanced Python. I think is the official name, and that will be out by the end of the year, hopefully. Okay, yeah, you and I were both very passionate about online courses. Uh, tell me what is what what's in your intermediate and your advanced courses. Oh, I'd have to stretch my brain to remember exactly the contents of those courses. But um, I know the intermediate course, we start getting into things like decorators, uh, class properties, some of the more the, the details of classes beyond just, you know, uh, uh, functions and methods. Here's how you define a class and add fields to it. Right. Yeah. The getting, getting beyond that. But things that are beyond the basics, you'd be surprised at how many things there are that go into the basic course that are really, really basic. And I mean, the, the, the course is quite long and doesn't really scratch the surface of Python. So anything uh, like, like I, I mentioned, uh, decorators or uh, probably Lambda, Lambda expression type thing. I think Lambda's in there, context managers, um, implementing a lot of the Dunder magic methods, and that, that kind of stuff is in the intermediate. And then the advanced class is where you start to get into things like what we talked about earlier, finders and loaders, um, or you start getting into uh, meta classes and you know things that uh, we, we classify to a degree as things you might do once a year instead of things that you do every day uh, as, a, as a professional Python programmer. I mean, finders and loaders, I programmed Python for 20 years and never used it, but it's an interesting and important part of the language. So it needs to be in there somewhere. Yeah. And once you understand it, maybe you don't use it often, but knowing the mechanics helps you understand a lot of things often at that level. Yeah, and you, you know you have that in your pocket, and so that it, that might be the most elegant solution for some particular problem you face, rather than some horrible hack you would have to come up with otherwise. So, it's um the advanced stuff is for people who are you know, using Python a lot and uh, need to find the best solutions and really understand the inner workings of, of the Python runtime. Yeah, cool. So if you guys have a Plural Site subscription, go over there and type in Python in the search box, and you'll find Austin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. And you also wrote some books too. We do have some books. Yeah, we have uh, the, the books are based uh, largely on the same material as the Plural Site courses. And the first one is, I think, 90% done now. It's on LeanPub. It's called The Python Apprentice. Uh, the second and third books, the, the Python Journeyman and The Python Master, are in the works and will be published probably not this year, but uh, soon. And since they're on LeanPub, you, you can you know get the early version and we'll keep sending you updates as we make updates to the books. But um, if you prefer, if you prefer books, these are available as uh, I think PDFs and Mobis and EPUBs on, on the LeanPub site. Nice. And that's self-publishing, right? That's, uh, that is self-publishing. Yes. Yeah. Very cool. I'm a big fan of self-publishing. So I, I like to see when people are succeeding with that. That's great. Yeah. So I'll be sure to link to those, all, all those things in the, the show notes as well. Okay. That'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. Very interesting. Definitely cool. Two more questions before I let you go. What's your favorite PyPI package? I, I saw the other day there's over 80,000 distinct packages out there. That's an insane number. That's probably why people <laughs> love Python. But there's got to be something that like you'll, you've had exposure to that you want to share. Like, oh, you should check this out. Well, uh, it's, I'm gonna, it's going to feel like a bit of a cheat, but DocOpt. DocOpt is, is one that I, once I learned about it, I started using it on almost every project I, um, I use. Uh, I, but I know that it's not that well known. Uh, it's not as well known as I think it should be. So I, I, I'll just put a, you know, a, a second vote in for DocOp. That's that. If, for my money, that's that's the that's the tool I keep going back to in, in PyPI every time. And it should be more widely known and um, more widely used because it's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. I'll, I'll go ahead and throw one for uh, Cosmic Ray in there for you because <laughs> that, that's pretty awesome and very interesting to check out. <laughs> thanks, thanks. And then. 
you mentioned Emacs earlier, but if you're going to write some Python code, what do you typically open up? Well, the, the short answer is Emacs. Um, I've been using Emacs for uh, almost as long as I've been using Python, I think. And it's it's in my fingers uh, to a degree. If, if I know that I'm working on just a dedicated Python project, then uh, PyCharm is a wonderful IDE. And it's, it's, uh, it's got a lot of powers that Emacs doesn't have when it comes to working with Python. De- well, that Emacs doesn't have yet, <laughs> I should say. Uh, but no, it, it's really great for just pure Python editing. I guess the reason I stick with Emacs is, um, uh, well, stubbornness to a degree. I just, I, I'm, I'm old and don't want to change. Um, but I'm also very often working on multiple languages at the same time in any given project. You know, everything from JavaScript to Python to, you know, L to, to whatever it happens to be part of that project. And I find that Emacs makes it easier for me to do that. Uh, or at least, um, it has, it's not, it, it's the best of, it's the best of breed for that kind of work from what I can tell. And, and honestly, Python as an Emacs IDE is pretty good. Um, you can do all sorts of fancy stuff in there if you want to spend the time to configure it. And if you use a package like, or, uh, an Emacs, a canned Emacs configuration like SpaceMax, uh, you'll find that you get, Pretty sophisticated support for things like completion right out of the box. You know, you get Jedi support and things like that. Uh, so it's, um, I know that it, it, I, I try not to recommend Emacs to new, new people, to p- people getting new to Python because that adds a whole level of complexity. But Emacs as a way of life is, uh, it's an interesting place to be. So <laughs> you could do a lot worse as a, as a programmer. So, uh, any final call to actions for all the listeners while well, you, you got the mic? Uh, any more calls to action? Are you looking for contributors to your project? Certainly, for, like you were. Certainly, Cosmic Ray could 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 use some um, some people who are willing to put in some work. We have, of course, the, the GitHub issues page where I I keep track not just of defects but also of you know th- the, the higher level issues that need to be done. Um, I mentioned earlier that we have this uh, this pressing need for um, being able to embed exceptions and processing instructions in our code so that uh, Cosmic Ray can know to not do certain kinds of mutations. And that's a, that's a big project that um, somebody might be able to take on. Uh, we have, I guess the, the two other big topics I could think of are um, support for more different, for different kinds of modules. Right now, Cosmic Ray can only work against modules that are written in pure Python code, so .py files. But of course, there are plenty of other exotic kinds of uh, modules out there. So Cosmic Ray needs to either gracefully skip over those other kinds or learn how to process those. And there's no support for that right now. And that's a big limiting factor. And the other is, um, this is more of a researchy thing, but the integration with coverage testing that I talked about earlier, being able to take output from say coverage.py and use that to determine how we can narrow down the scope of um, Cosmic Ray mutation testing runs and, and make it a more practical tool. But um, really it's, uh, you know, go to the issues page on, on GitHub and look and you'll see the nature of the things that are going on. Yeah, that, that would be my call to action, I guess, for Cosmic Ray. All right, fantastic. I'll put the link to the GitHub repo in the show notes. So Austin, it's been really fun to talk about this idea of mutation testing. It's, I, I think it's a, a really interesting evolution, if you will, of, of <laughs> all, yeah. all the testing <laughs> tools, right? And it's, I can see a place when this algorithm gets tuned and the, like the various optimizations you talked about get in there, that this could be a big part of day-to-day work. It's cool. Cool. I'm glad you think that. And, and uh, thanks for having me on the show to to talk about it. It's something I really enjoy uh, talking about in public. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you bet. You bet. Thanks for being on the show. And it was great to see you last week. Take care. It was great seeing you last week. All right. Bye, Mike. This has been another episode of Talk Python to Me. Today's guest was Austin Bingham. And this episode has been sponsored by Hired and Snaps AI. Thank you guys for supporting the show. Hired wants to help you find your next big thing. Visit Hired.com slash TalkPython to me to get five or more offers with salary and equity presented right up front and a special listener signing bonus of $2,000. SnapCI is modern, continuous integration and delivery. Build, test, and deploy your code directly from GitHub, all in your browser with debugging, Docker, and parallelism included. Try them for free at snap.ci slash TalkPython. Are you or a colleague trying to learn Python? Have you tried books and videos that left you bored by just covering topics point by point? Well, check out my online course, Python Jumpstart by Building 10 Apps at talkpython.fm slash course to experience a more engaging way to learn Python. You can find the links from this episode at talkpython.fm slash episodes slash show slash 63. Be sure to subscribe to the show. Open your favorite podcatcher and search for Python. We should be right at the top. You can also find the iTunes feed at slash iTunes. Google Play feed at slash play and direct RSS feed at slash RSS on talkpython.fm. Our theme music is Developers, Developers, Developers by Corey Smith, who goes by Smix. 
You can hear the entire song at talkpython.fm slash music. This is your host, Michael Kennedy. Thanks so much for listening. I really appreciate it. Smix, let's get out of here. Stating with my voice, there's no norm that I can feel within. Haven't been sleeping, I've been using lots of rest. I'll pass the mic back to who rocked it best.